All right, it's my pleasure today to introduce to you 2019 Nerd Summit Sunday keynote speaker, Mickey Metz. Mickey is a member of Visionary Agaric, a web development cooperative in Boston. Agaric is a tech co-op in the free software for community building movement using tools like Voice over IP, Drupal, and GNU Linux. She is the liaison between the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network and the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. And she is also a member of May 1st People Links Leadership Committee. Her four topic areas, community building, industry organizing, free software liberation, and cooperative development converge in her presentations. I also want to draw your attention to today a uh, a book of which she is a contributing author called Hours to Hack and to Own, a top 10 book of 2019 listed by Wired Magazine. And uh, they're also for sale, right up here. And with that, Mickey Metz, take it away. Thank you, hello everybody. And this is an excellent nerd Summit. I've been coming here for uh, <clears throat> four or five years, and each one has been better and better, and uh, I've learned so much and meet so many cool people. So today I'm going to ask or pose the question, how uh, can we prevent this Orwellian 1984 digital world that has been foisted upon us? Um, mostly I'm talking about economic liberation, uh, versus convenience and corporate or cultural pressure. And corporate cultural pressure, like the Google world, you know, you're a, a member of this society. So I'm going to present the issues as I see them. And the only way I could really frame this after, you know, uh, struggling for a while is that I will reveal how I was introduced to my own personal power, because I believe that is what it is at the center of everything. Um, we're living in a society where, as mere individuals, power seems out of our control and in the hands of those who can distribute information swiftly and widely, or they can refuse to disseminate any information. Um, and corporate algorithms now sort us into filter bubbles and they're also used to categorize our every failure and success. Uh, national governments track everything we type or say in global databases like PRISM. PRISM? Oh, I mean, that was... <laughs> I really didn't mean that. Or, <laughs> or Echelon. <laughs> and uh, even local police invade our privacy with devices like Stingray cell phone trackers. We may build our own profiles online, but um, we don't have access to the meta profile made by the corporate entities that our queries traverse as we navigate online, purchasing goods or just logging into a site where we have a, uh, an account. No matter what we do, we're tracked and categorized as a threat or a non-threat. Which bucket do you fall in? What compromises a threat? And how could you be a threat? Well, in the last uh, year, we've seen things like Eric Lundgren has been jailed for redistributing software that was already freely available. And uh, just last week, Chelsea Manning uh, was rearrested in Virginia for refusing to answer questions from a grand jury. So you might think of Google services as one irresistible single sign-on that makes it so convenient uh, you just can't resist it. But does anyone remember AOL? <laughs> yeah. Well, as we know, it's a group of bundled third-party services that include internet access. And people bought it and believed this was the internet. This is the internet. It's AOL. Right. So uh, basically they're paying for a slew of services they didn't want or need. And um, those services are mostly available outside of AOL for free, usually. 
Um, but they were packaged nicely, and so the users didn't even know they were getting a modified and curated version of the internet. Um, and people on other service providers were enjoying a much larger internet. So selling one thing while calling it a name that is a misnomer and, or that is by a mission mentioning uh, that it is another thing. Um, we've all seen this play out in the net neutrality wars and news. Like, why is that named so badly? You know, it, it's just a, it, it's, it's crazy. So this same wall garden type effect has worked well. Um, it's worked for companies like Apple and they seem to have a real grip on it, making someone feel as if they belong. And if you're wondering whether you belong or not, I can assure you if you're even wondering, you're not in there. <laughs> so uh, two things that propel this behavior of misnaming and hiding things, fear of being left out and not fitting in with a social group, has always been the realm of those without their own personal power. And they're just never sure if they're in or out. So fitting into a social group is usually related to material possessions in the corporate world, unless you have been granted symbolic power. In that case, uh, symbolic power would be something like uh, you inherit a corporate entity but know nothing about running a company. Um, <laughs> You are the boss of people now, or are you? Well, inside you know that you're not qualified. What do you do? You either rise to the occasion or insert your favorite public corporate failure story here. <laughs> um, <laughs> many people have risen and fallen much faster than they've risen. So we're being herded into having a one point of entry which means we have a one point of failure. <laughs> and when using single sign-on makes it so convenient, we can't resist. We have our one Google account, and it will grant us access to the rest of the world and the content we're seeking. We loathe passwords, right? <laughs> Anyone like passwords, the system? <laughs> you know, and security PIN numbers? And they seem to merely block access to ourselves, like when we're trying to frantically remember that pin to get into our bank or to call our mom or what, what was that pin? Um, well, we enjoy the fact that we can use Google or Facebook to sign in easily. And we don't have to give any of our account information over and over and over again. What a relief. Sure. <laughs> Yet we expect to have privacy when we're searching the internet for health services, uh, solutions to personal problems. Um, but the targeted advertisements uh, still show up <laughs> for no matter what we search for. And we sometimes fail to understand the consequences of them showing up, um, particularly people who aren't well versed with technology. Uh, they have no idea why they're seeing an ad for something they just searched for yesterday. Um, they, they usually don't even connect it. So we finally know that convenience was not meant for us and at that time it's a little too late. The platform owner has complete control and if your posted content is not touting the party line, the flick of a switch, there you are, your light goes out. So why would a corporation intrude on our most private thoughts and record them? Why do most people not seem to even care about that, especially online? Well, I believe that most fail to heed the call to protect all of our privacy as people feel really small and weak and they say, I have nothing to hide. So this attitude is great for corporations as they need the social control to guide us in more than just buying options. Um, it's aimed at directing every action and interaction that we undertake. So what are the sources of the problem and how does it spread? It's, it seems like a viral infection. <laughs> so um, I guess I will advance a slide. <laughs> so 
as we know, Big Brother is watching you, and there's just 5G towers going up everywhere, and none of us are really sure of all the things that they do. Um, you know, so I'm going to oops, skip that slide for a second and get to my other slide. Oh, great. Okay, it is this one. So I had a rough childhood, growing up surrounded by criminals and con artists. And there were also some nice, nice folks caught up in the political drama, some very good people. And <laughs> um, they, they were mixed in with the citizens of a small town that was filled with a high level of evildoers that masqueraded as benevolent bestowers of love and friendship. Most of these people were using symbolic power with statements like, I am the son of so-and-so, or I have a PhD in such and such, or I have some proximity to a person with perceived power. This has been practiced throughout history, and I don't see an end in sight. Yet, it is this way of thinking that I believe leads to a gradual loss of our own personal power. We exchange our power for that of an agreed upon title in which we find value. And if there is enough symbolic value, then that turns into pseudo-currency with perks. Um, have you ever wondered why wealthy people receive gifts from those that aspire to be wealthy? Even though they could easily pay for the item, a free coffee, a free valet, a movie pass here and there. A person on the corner asking for spare change is not the investment that an aspiring wealthy person needs to make. They want a ticket to the VIP room and they believe they can purchase it through gifting a rich person. Not so. Your gift or someone paying for a service is usually taken in stride and sometimes it is precisely how the person remains wealthy. You may remain symbolically wealthy by flaunting your symbolic capital. This is played out in corporations and within our families. Till we address this structure on a family level, it cannot be addressed on a societal level. Big Brother has many meanings and is in many, many rooms. Most importantly, we must disregard this hierarchical labeling system that is foisted upon us at every level, level of society be rebellious, to be recognized by people whose values you do not know and eager to wield the symbolic power the title holds? Well, is it silly to bestow titles on people in a symbolic power play, thus giving them a status that is hard to control if they have no personal power? Without a sense of self-worth and a symbolic title, it is easy to become corrupted by symbolic power. Titles lead to a misconception of oneself and of others. So, oops, I'm going to go back to that other slide. As you can see, I was up all night sorting my slides. <laughs> oh, great, and now I'm working with a Libre office, and it looks like my pictures have disappeared, so we're off into the rough. <laughs> Great. We didn't need those anyway. <laughs> so what I'm talking about is roots and anchors, and they're important when visualizing your own support network. So are the people that surround you when your first impressions of yourself and position are entered into your perception. Who am I to others? Who do I appear to be to others? Well, most of the same 100 students that graduated from high school with me were there from first grade. So it's an odd instance where we all got a pretty solid reflection of who we were and how we fit into the big picture. So in my town, we were all programmed to be leaders. These were, I went to school with sons and daughters of influential people that would become heirs to vast family resources. Yet talking about those resources and the part they play in the big picture was not a thing to do, no. 
In my school experience, there were no visible <coughs> students with what we call low self-esteem. On the surface, everyone was viable and essential to the conversation. So one significant difference here is that in my life, there were no upper classes in my high school. And I realize almost everyone goes through that with having people older than you, you know, Im impress you and make you do things. But uh, we didn't have any upperclassmen, so we got a very different view of the world without um, hazing or pranking. And these were all sons and daughters of influential people, so it was, we were mostly left to our own devices. There weren't really punishments. No one got called out for things. It was just a talking to in the hallway or something. So. Um, that was, I was in the class of 1971, it was a newly built school, and so we had no pressures. We were also the first class that turned 18 when the voting age had been uh, lowered to 18. So there was pressure from pounds people and parents and stuff to do that. So Westport and Weston, Connecticut in the 1960s uh, was a home and it was home to people who owned large and irresponsible corporations, kingpins of the entertainment industry, and pharmaceutical companies, which destroyed many of my upscale friends and their families through bogus prescriptions, including medication for financially induced maladies, such as malaise. <laughs> Does everyone know what malaise is? <laughs> Have you had any malaise? Yes. <laughs> so, upon my exit from this town, I chose to leave college offers on the table and experience a world without a safety net. I was so sick of people having safety nets. I never sought financial support from my parents and had found creative things to do uh, for work, such as becoming a foreign car mechanic in the next town, the next, next town over, um, where people soiled their hands. <laughs> and uh, I became a, uh, a helper at my friend's father's garage, my friend Willie. And um, one night, Willie's father had a fleet of Nazi staff cars delivered to the shop. One dark summer night, yes. We're like, what is this, 3 a.m.? We're sitting there drinking and smoking, and here comes this delivery. They had insignias emblazoned and swastikas all over them. And the first thing we did was jump in them and drive around the town. It's like, oh no. <laughs> all right, so <laughs> here we are, three in the morning, honking horns, driving around in these staff cars. And uh, we had no idea of the implications of pain we could have caused. I was so ensconced in the elite mindset and so comfortable that I saw nothing wrong. That was my eye opener. I was 17 and I had also sat in those rooms in the late 60s with Madison Avenue executives who were laughing at us. They were laughing at all the money they would make from selling the ridiculous fashions that the hippies were wearing. They would sell these for hundreds of dollars in their Macy's department stores. Meanwhile, hippies were making clothes from dumpsters. People were walking around with cameras following them. What are you wearing? You know, it, was, it was very insane. <laughs> no one really understood the implications of how it would lead two years later. So, but more importantly, um, these executives were stoked about the control that they could have on people purchasing their products and self-categorizing themselves with these fashions. It came to public awareness in a documentary called Merchants of Cool. Um, my friend Douglas Rushkoff um, was involved in that and it was produced in 2001 and it, it just detailed how advertising agencies broke people up, boys and girls, into two categories called MOOCs and midriffs, and severely targeted each of them differently. So I didn't know all of this until years later when I put the puzzle together. So uh, to sum it up, my childhood experiences led me to a conclusion 
that sitting in a mansion with every material thing you ever dreamed of or wished for is a task so dull that a billion dollar pharmaceutical industry rose up to help the depressed masses of wealthy capitalists and their emotionally downtrodden offspring. <laughs> yes, poor people and wealthy people may be depressed by the same things, but they come from different perspectives. They both suffer from the lack of education. The wealthy do this by choice, um, by bad companion choices. The wealthy have way too many candidates and cannot sort through them. Um, unwanted children, this could be silent religion or air rebellion. I'm going to have so many you have to give to me. <laughs> um, career choices, uh, the wealthy um, have many drunken buddies with ideas, but they have the seed money. <laughs> so uh, they also suffer from lack of skills. Um, specifically because most of the wealthy people I know spent time either sailing, swimming, golfing, playing tennis, um, and they thought of training as something that um, is for poor people or their children. Yeah. But uh, it can't be training where you use your hands to do anything. So not many people can cope with that when, you know, like a... Um, they get out of school and they realize what they have is a uh, liberal arts degree <laughs> and they've also had low socio-centric information, like uh, they've been watching television and not knowing what's going on in their community, and a life that seems like a long dark highway with no exits, full of tolls, but to seal your fate you must appear happy when you go through those tolls. Yes. So one significant difference of existence is that a poor person can be tied to bad choices simply from lack of any options in their community or their state. Yet wealthy are bound to glory by proxy through their relatives, inheritances, and pecking orders of their family trees. Hmm. Has anyone here ever been threatened with being disowned? or having your legacy denied and give, giving it to your sibling, or worse yet, a distant relative? Ooh. Well, that, that can be really life-changing, and uh, people I saw go through it did not really fare well. And um, so a person can lose touch with their personal power if they attach it to things that are not inside of them. If you attach your personal power to something else, that sled can take off with you. I mean, without you. <laughs> Another 40, whatever. <laughs> so, is it uncool to walk around saying that you are the heir to a sizable standard oil investor's portfolio and that has been in your family for generations? Is it okay to say you have failed because you are heir to a dysfunctional system that favors people unlike yourself. I don't know. Not me. I don't hear many people bragging about their Standard Oil portfolios that blatantly. They do it in other ways with their symbolic power, throwing that around. So there's a disparity in the educational system I've noticed since I moved to Boston in the late 70s. Um, it requires me to leave out a uh, part of my learned vocabulary as I converse with people from different neighborhoods. There is just a huge, huge difference. Many people I meet in um, areas like um, that are outside of Boston proper, it's just they have a low standard for which students they pass on and it becomes too much of a burden to pay individual attention to people. So en masse, people get graduated that don't have skills. Some may not even know how to read. So many people I meet in these areas are resigned to accept the low standard of living, while their home is literally in the shadow of an Ivy League school. Some think they will not live past the age of 25 due to enforced crime and violence in their communities. I say enforced crime because criminal behavior is perpetuated 
by arcane laws, untamed predictive policing used on community members. And by enforced crime, I refer to areas of the city that are depressed financially with no opportunities for citizens to survive and excel. So locals go through a revolving door between the prison system and back into their neighborhood. And this is a model path for younger generations to repeat. The schools in the neighborhood usually do not have funding to provide a robust learning atmosphere, while most universities in the area have billions of dollars in endowment funds. Where do these funds go? Who has control of these funds? And right now, I'm going to see if I could do something over here with this and maybe make the slides reappear or at least get to the next one. Yeah, it has something in it. So, the for-profit private prison system is working. And as long as private prisons fill beds, the corporation is making a profit. So who should be ashamed of this? It's not us. It's not any single person in particular. But it is a system that we all live in, and we all can change it if we work um, collectively, collaboratively, cooperatively, together. So it used to be a hidden thing that uh, these, everyone is silent about the corporations making profits off of people being in prison beds. But it's not hidden anymore. People are starting to talk about it. And now we can look into the workflow of gentrification of an area, pricing workers out of a neighborhood and buying the land for a low cost to build more luxury housing for students and tourism. And I'm shocked at the number of Bostonians that do not know where MIT is. I encourage you to do a little experiment and just when you're out with strangers, just ask, like you're asking for directions even. Do you know where MIT is? Do you know where Harvard is? Um, it, it's, it's staggering. Why would they not know that? Um, so the, it's still bothering, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and when you go to these institutions, um, when we go there, we're going there, we're here now. We're doing stuff, we're, our brains are activated, we're, we're working, but um, we don't realize that there's a huge blinking sign where you do not belong here, you do not belong here, because it's only vis visible to those from disenfranchised places. We don't see those signs. It's like that movie, what was it, Them, where you put on the sunglasses and you see the obey signs. They live. They live, thank you. <laughs> and they do. <laughs> well, um, we don't see those signs, so I encourage you to try to see those signs. Try to see, how would someone feel uncomfortable in here? It's, it's 70 degrees, it's really nice. <laughs> All my friends are here, yes, so. The you do not belong here syndrome is um, it's rampant and it, it turns so many people away from knowledge that that's why I believe it has been put there. <laughs> we can tear it down. Yes. So those who grew up in a society that nurtured our personal power, we just won't see this at all and it's going to be really hard to look for. So we have to realize that personal power can also go awry and become a source of violence. When verbal tenacity, moral capacity, and critical thinking are lacking, and those are the things that are left out of most of the disenfranchised schools. We don't have time for that. You know, We just need to get people passed to another grade. So I'm asking, when you hear an absolutely horrifying story with all the gory details, does it depress you? Or does it make you feel small and weak? Or does it empower you to seek a solution? Find an answer to this, make some change. Well, the media tries to make you feel small and alone, constantly dunning you with these things that you can't control. Someone's dying over here, someone's hurt over here, someone needs this, and you can do nothing. 
in your chair. It overemphasizes individual violence, which we do not have control over, and it ignores the structural violence that we live in daily. The structural violence that it just takes over, but if we are not prepared to see it and are not looking for it, it goes right by and we just have a nice time at the event. So, over time, we're impressed with stimuli in every aspect of our lives, yet our reaction to the same stimuli can be dramatically different from one person to the other. Why is this? One person runs away from the image in horror, the other person busts out laughing. Do we get to choose our own reactions or are those programmed into us? I think it's partially both, but um, try to be aware of that next time you're in a situation. So why isn't Joe laughing? Well, there are many reasons and personal power can go awry and it can make you feel like you are carrying a, a burdenous thing. So personal power, we must enable others to feel their personal power and to help them teach us. And everyone can help the next person feel their own personal power. So the question then becomes, not how can we stop a dystopian 1984 future or now, but how can we awaken personal power within us all to change the present and the future for the best? The question then becomes, how do we help others access their personal power and use it to make our communities thrive collectively? How can we steel ourselves against feeling powerless? The imposter syndrome. Anyone had imposter syndrome or know someone who has it? Okay, well that's, Personal power, imposter syndrome, it, it kind of, it's all mixed in the same bag. But where I came from, the first rule of power was to hide it. Hide it. Don't let anyone see it. Just act like you're normal. And the first rule of symbolic power is to flaunt it. Get out there and tell them you're my son. You know, get out there and tell them, you know, you come from a long line of whatever. So symbolic power is held in the hands of very few individuals because we as citizens ascribe the power to an elected officials and we designate them to carry out our demands. This would be great if there was a mechanism in place to lodge our demands in an orderly fashion where everyone could have a chance to weigh in on the matter. We have the technology to have systems places that would serve us and do this, but um, yet we do not have them in place. We have missiles. <laughs> Anybody got one? Right. No. <laughs> right, we've all paid for missiles, so maybe we should have our name on the missile. Uh, <laughs> symbolic leaders meet with power brokers, mostly on golf courses and in country clubs around the world, and this is where decisions are made about how you and I will be allowed to live and even if we'll be allowed to live. So what is personal power and how does it affect the outcome of civil societies? Um, well, examining convenience and expecting what's not cool, odd thoughts and weird perspectives, why are we fearful of even entertaining such notions in our daily workspaces? Everything's got to be in line. We look at these things, but we do not inspect them fully. Like, what is not cool? Well, we do not have, uh, we, we do not have, we do not ask ourselves, sorry, if we like something because it's seen as popular or because we have a genuine affinity for it. We tend to look at things that register on the public news channel without regards to values of, from the sources. Where did it come from? as well as the language that they use to describe criminals and victims. This language is threaded into our discourse and ends up affecting how we tend to stick to publicly acceptable scripts. I know a lot of people here don't do that, thank God, but there, there's a world that does that. There are publishers and there are readers, 
Now we know that the large publishing entities have a monopolistic grip on news and media, so they control what gets to us. Those rewarded by publishing members of society, news organizations, etc., are notably the ones that stick to the script that embeds in most a need to reiterate and disseminate the same old story. This internal program instills only one notion of success. It's pretty much accepted worldwide, grabbing the gold, getting the girl, escaping to your paradise island while having faceless servants attend your every whim. That's success. That's power. Or is it? It is symbolic power that you and everyone you know will probably never achieve. Even if you have it, symbolic power can lead to a sense of entitlement. And that's part of it going awry. So what, what would be the difference between personal power and a sense of entitlement? Well, personal power comes from knowing who you are, being able to act based on your values and ethics at any moment. Entitlement comes from thinking you are more powerful than you are and believing it, internalizing it, acting on it in ways that deny others privilege, such as swooping into a parking space when you've seen someone else angling for the same space. Um, we've lost grace, and with that, we've lost an opportunity to expand our network of friends. That person in that car could be, you have no idea what they could have meant to you gone, opportunities missed from not cooperating and not sharing. So we fear losing and looking like a chump. We're also more likely to remember negative encounters and relay them to others at the water cooler. As individuals, we may have empathy, but when we get into small groups, we tend to take joy in someone else's failure and downfall, and that is seen as normal and has become a bonding point for many. That's got to go. We could tie this into commercialized sports and many other sources, but that would be another day-long talk. <laughs> Entitlement is basically an attitude and pretense of superiority without facts or any reasons to back them up. So movements and networks I think movements and networks are some of the most important things that we will, that we are faced with or that we have access to and that we're building. Without movements, nothing would have changed. But that movement, you have to realize, was sparked usually by one person, one person's idea, one person's dedication, one person just taking something on and going, are you with me? Or it could be a group, a group that sits down and all agrees that this has got to end. So there's many opportunities to get, this is the positive part. <laughs> <laughs> it's all doom, gloom, horror, you'll never get out alive. <laughs> We're at a really, really exciting point in our lives. There are many opportunities to get involved in the cooperative development of platforms collectively and democratically owned by the people who use them. So many projects are already built and others are underway. You can join in and help finish building one. Well, notice I said finish. That's a bad word. Is anything you guys do ever finish? <laughs> to clients, when is it finished? When will my website be finished? <laughs> it won't. <laughs> oh, God. We're at, we're at 20 of <laughs> Thank you. <Okay. laughs> All right, so um, there's a movement. Has anyone heard of platform cooperativism? A few people. All right, well... It's a movement to build platforms that are owned by the people, um, like Uber, owned by the drivers. It's not that far a stretch to think of. Well, I was fortunate enough to be asked to write a chapter in this wonderful book. I'm in here with geniuses, guys. <laughs> really? <laughs> I don't know. But um, 
Uh, it's a book about owning what we use. This is not rocket science, but it does take collective cooperation. It takes all of us knowing a bit about it and using our personal powers to connect people to build things. Like, if we did like a game here, I could connect people like, you're working on this, I know she's working on something similar. That's kind of a game I play all day long. It's really fun. So, reading something like that can really open your eyes to there is a whole world of developers, people like us, beyond us, whatever, below us, next to us, that are all building actively into the same thing freeing ourselves to own what we use. And developers hold a crucial position as movements need the combined efforts, technical and non-technical people. You can go to, my slides will be available online. I'll write it on the blackboard like old-fashioned ways. Like when I was little. Right. <laughs> And the Platform Cooperative Movement has formed a consortium which recently received a million dollar grant to build the Platform Cooperative Toolkit. Now the toolkit is not software, it includes some software, but mostly it's the whole gamut of things you would need to build a, a Platform Cooperative together resources, legal documents, um, steps you need to go to, who you would need to talk to locally to get some per to do something, whatever. It's the whole like soup to nuts thing and it's not just for developers or people who, who build things in the digital world. Right, so throughout history change has been made by people demanding it and demanding it together. Um, once we get together, they just can't say no. I just came back from Mexico speaking at an event where 9,000 electrical workers formed a cooperative and um, went on strike. Now they serve electricity to a larger part of Mexico and they're still growing. So what you can do together, we haven't even really tried to do that yet. I know we're at the start of it where we have these wonderful nerd summit. It's just like a wonderful conference because it's not focused on anything. There's, you know, Drupal conferences, WordPress conferences, all kinds of PHP conferences, all kinds of narrowly focused conferences. The thing I love about this is we're all in it together but we're all doing vastly different things that kind of overlap a little bit. So it's, it's really exciting to see so many people from so many different paths just come together to do a wonderful thing. And um, there's some unwonderful things <laughs> too. <laughs> Is anyone working on any projects that may be abusing users? How do we know? How would you know that? Are these questions that a developer asks? Oh, I love this job, sir, but um, am I going to be abusing users? <laughs> How many? <laughs> you know, I'm abusing thousands, hundreds of thousands of users. Yes. Well, this is where a, a movement called Design Justice comes in. And um, there's some people at MIT that I've been talking with about this. What is Design Justice? It's just that inspecting your project from the beginning at who could be who could possibly be abused by this and how could how could it hurt anyone? Well no one raises the question so maybe we should try to do that and figure out ways to do that and pass them on to others. Like if you find a channel to do that, great, let us know. So who are the developers working on facial recognition, spyware for corporations? And if it's such a good thing, why are they not proud of it? Why are they not screaming from the balcony, hey, I'm so powerful, I'm creating the next facial recognition, rec recognition thing that will find you in a crowd. And 
No, it's similar to a standard oil shareholder stepping up and revealing their income is aligned from armed forces killing people in other countries in oil wars. Yes. <laughs> So I don't think people will be standing up doing that soon. I never hear anyone say, their stock went up because people died. No, doesn't, no, I don't think I'll hear that soon. So there's campaigns like Tech Won't Build It, which um, started a few months ago, beginning of last, uh, middle of last year, I guess, and um, it's about saying no to building invasive AI and facial recognition software for groups like ICE, you know, things, things that are unconscionable. Why would I build that? I don't, I don't think I would. Well, you may have to, to eat. Well, maybe I can have a voice and change it. I'm gonna go get Kelly and Joe and Sam and, you guys, come here, what do you think? <laughs> Talk about it, see what can happen. Because even if you only make the trigger, trigger for the bomb, <laughs> it doesn't leave us blameless. You know? So the US is one of the world's largest arms dealers, and we all support the effort indirectly with our purchasing power. Um, the solution to the issues. Well, the only solution I see, and I started out with it, is with and through our own personal power and by enabling other people's personal power. I'm talking about going to rooms where you feel uncomfortable, where it's not your topic of choice. You know, I don't play bingo, but <laughs> maybe I look like I do. <laughs> so maybe I could infiltrate. <laughs> the bingo hacker, yes. <laughs> She's got an army of little old ladies and men. <laughs> They're going to change everything, right? Because we have nothing to lose. When you get my age, yes, your mouth opens more. <laughs> so try getting involved in discussing values and goals with others. Um, we recently opened up, a, Garrick has a show and tell every Wednesday, um, 11 a.m. We invite other developers to join in and, and have discussions about what, you know, uh, short presentations, lightning talks kind of a thing. But recently we were contacted by some co-ops in Argentina and they said, hey, why don't we have a talk about our values and goals and see where, where we meet and where we overlap. It was brilliant. We, we went over time talking and said, like, oh, I'm sitting through a presentation again. You know, like, oh, this isn't interesting. I don't know JavaScript. <laughs> and, and so we opened it up, and the last few weeks have been just dynamic talking about what are your values for your cooperative? How did you start? How do you, how do you handle getting paid? Um, how do you handle um, hierarchy? Do you have a manager? Do you, like all the talks of the inner workings of how a cooperative, worker-owned cooperative works. And that's what Agaric is. We've been solvent for 12 years, or 13 years, I guess it is. And um, it's just a wonderful way to work. Without bosses, um, the work needs to be managed. The people do not need to be managed. So we're adults, we can manage the work. And while I was sleeping, my wonderful partner updated my presentation with all these great images. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I could be up here crying, but instead, nah, you'll see them when you get home. You can download the slide deck, and there's some, there's some interesting stuff in there. Probably just interesting to me, but that's okay. <laughs> Because I have personal <laughs> Now see, that is entitlement. <laughs> An example of it. And um, so when I was little, I used to think of experiencing poverty as an exciting prospect. I was told about it when I was a child, that there were places where people lived in these big buildings and you had rooms all over them. You could have your friends next door, downstairs and upstairs, oh my God. And my parents were looking at me like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and the first thing I did was move to a city. It's like, great. I've been enjoying it ever since. I wouldn't live anywhere else by choice. 
Um, I've traveled around and this is where it is. So I didn't mean I wanted to live in abject poverty for extended times, but I wanted to have the experience of not having a safety net. I just got so overwhelmed with seeing all these people with safety nets doing such unproductive things. You know, they would just, you know, use their safety net to travel and just do tourist things. And most, a lot of my friends' families' houses were filled with rooms from their trips. You know, this is the Egypt room. This is the France room. This is when we went to Malaysia. Got all these things. And it, it's just like, wow, what is this, a museum? <laughs> I guess so. So we need to rewrite some of these um, APIs, the human API, that talks to people where they're coming from. I first touched the computer when I was 45, and within two weeks I had risen to a level of competency beyond anyone in my crowd. That's because my crowd was a bunch of middle-aged punk rockers <laughs> working at factories and as waitstaff. And um, it didn't matter to me, I just wanted to get on the computer so I could send images and videos of my band to record sex in, in Los Angeles and be discovered. Um, that didn't happen, thank God. <laughs> I didn't get raped through those calls. But um, what did happen was I entered a new world through a secret doorway. And when I made my first little website for my band, I called to get it uploaded to a, uh, a web host. And before hanging up, they said, do you know anyone who builds websites? I looked around and said, me! <laughs> and they said, well, come on down. Um, that was my job for the next few years, where I learned all the critical things about the underpinning of the internet and how it, how it works and how you do stuff. I became one of the first video beta testers in 1997 or 6 and um, so within a year of um, crazy Mickey telling people I'm gonna get my band on the internet it's 1996 and we're gonna have videos of our band all over and people are like no oh, that's just impractical Mickey well within a few months after getting this job becoming the beta tester for this video thing I was doing it why why did I not stop when people said, oh, God, that'll never happen? People were even coming up to me and showing me, look, it's so slow, this video is frozen, you know, the, you know, like on my laptop. How are you going to do that on the internet? You know, it's like, well, I don't know, but I'm doing it. Go away. <laughs> 1997. 1997, yes. No, 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 no. <laughs> Desktop. <laughs> <laughs> Desktop. Well, yes, I did buy a laptop, and then it was like one of those big cube ones. It was huge, thick computer with a tiny screen. I don't know why the thing was so big. The screen was this big. But um, yeah. So why do mo most developers believe that intrusive and malicious code that they could be a part of writing will never affect them? Well, I see them like the Egyptians. They dig the graves and get pushed into them. Then the next people get pushed into that, so that no one has the secret, and so on and so forth. And um, it, it just seems like what I call the golden coder syndrome. It's a close cousin to affluenza. It's where a developer believes that they're so far from the target audience that they're safe from any consequences. This is rarely the case for very long. Why don't we see this? It happens over and over again. It's only the case until, right up until you get escorted to the parking lot with your cardboard box full of symbolic power trappings. So your ending will most likely go unnoticed by anyone except your closest work buddies. And um, it's it just, you're in a box and you can't get out, but you can by talking bonding with other people over personal power. Notice people who don't have personal power. See if you can step in and support their gaining personal power. And it can just be exponential. It can um, just spin from the inside out. So great software starts with a greater understanding of people and their needs. 
Does anyone disagree with that? Awesome. If you don't understand the people, you will never make the right software. And sometimes you won't, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> You'll think you understood. Isn't that what you said? Green. I thought you said green. No. <laughs> so um, when, I, when I try this, supporting other people's personal power, it's always welcomed. I'm never turned away. And we both learn from each other's skills, and we have great conversations. And um, so no one would expect to hear me say a lot of this, because I have a long history as a cowboy coder, a lone builder of things. And um, I've, I've really had a kind of a difficult job of coming into the co-developing co thing, um, using Git. Yeah. I'm all itchy now. Okay. <laughs> yes, you say things like get. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'll make it. I'll get there. But um, trying to, uh, so to sum it up, trying to notice the people that are adversely impacted by designs. Try to notice that, the design justice. Who's be, who could possibly be injured by this? Well, things we don't know. When I was little, they put up a mural in uh, the pharmacy um, where I lived, and I should mention, we were the only black family in town, but my father had superpowers because he owned the local news radio station. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was kind of strange. But anyway, they put up a mural in the pharmacy where the ice cream soda fountain was, and it was a picture of a pygmy with all these animals coming at the pygmy because it had dropped some ice cream and you weren't sure if the animals were going to do it was a takeoff on that uh, artwork where they have the crocodiles um, eating the black children that from like civil war and those type of strange little um, mementos or whatever but um, it, it was like put up there like without any regard for what it really says because the people who put it up there didn't know any black people. They, and they certainly didn't know any pygmies. I mean, you know, like, it was just a strange thing. So we recently had a talk about it. Someone brought it up because the artist had died. And they were saying, oh, she was such a wonderful artist. And people were brought in, bringing up about, that was kind of a rude like mural. And no one really even discussed it or realized it. But um, you know, they were doing it out of love but it was really a hurtful thing. So design justice can be looked at in ways of that. Who is this mural supporting and what is it saying to everyone? So I ask you to consider having an open mind, being able to listen carefully to the needs of a community and engage members in the building of whatever it is that you're building. I ask that you realize the value of free software and it is the, it's the foundation of human rights now in this era of digital media. Those without internet access will be severely inhibited from taking part in society and having a vote to represent them as a citizen of Earth. A few years ago, not being able to get online only meant that you didn't have to see hundreds of cat images, but now, <laughs> today, it means you may get less health care less work, less information that is imperative to your survival. So if programmers have the people's best interests at heart, we really can't go wrong to keep the conversation open. To know what those interests are, we must talk to people and to know their hearts and our own hearts and to protect each other's privacy as if it was our very own. Thank you. address of where the uh, slides are online and they're filled with resources. The last slide has... Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Great. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. There are 20. <laughs>